Lord says, you know what, you uh, that you want to do it for next week, you just come to me and I'll give you the paper so you can rehearse if you want to. If you don't want to, that's fine, but um, I would appreciate any volunteers. Sorry, I'm saying. And it's, it's normally for couples or two people, right? Yeah, it's two people, like a group of two. Um, but no, partially that, like, are playing with each other that, because of social distancing. So, they could, uh, two people that know each other well. Two, two people, that, that might be a married couple, even. Yeah. That was a show. <laughs> Family members, yes. Okay. Any age, doesn't matter. Okay, thank you, Susan. You do an excellent job with that. The uh, administrative assistance position has been filled by uh, Penny Prouse. She'll be taking over duties in March following her second COVID-19 vaccination. She will be in the office Tuesday and Thursday mornings from 9 till 1. Take time to thank Penny for her servant's heart when... Uh, after she gets her shot. Uh, the magazine rack in the cloakroom is full of fun stuff for taking. New stuff is added weekly. Uh, there are old church directories available also out in the Northex somewhere. Uh, please remember if you're the last one leaving the church building, turn off the lights and lock the doors. Uh, okay, and the rest, uh, you can read the rest in your bulletin. Are there any additional announcements at this time on uh, the far left, middle left, middle right, <laughs> far right? Oh, yes, Lois. All right, thank you, Lois. Any other announcements? Okay, if not, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll start with the service. Sorry. <laughs> it was a <little> <laughs>
one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his Son. Please be seated. So what are you giving up for Lent? I don't know. Why is Lent 40 days anyway? I'm not a math whiz, but it's not 40 days from Ash Wednesday to Easter. A couple days in February, 31 days in March, and a couple more days in April. Doesn't that add up to 46 days? Yes, but they don't count the Sundays since those are the days of feasting. On Sundays in Lent, we celebrate Jesus' victory over death. The number 40 in the Bible is mentioned a lot and is a, is a time of testing, trial, and a time to focus. Moses went up to, on South, Mount Sinai for 40 days to receive the law. Forty years in the desert the Jews were wandering, and Jesus fasted in the desert for 40 days before his ministry. That's why a lot of Christians give up something for Lent. It's meant to be a time that brings us into a closer relationship with God. Oh, okay, so whatever I give up or add to my schedule is supposed to bring me into a closer relationship with God and for us to think about what He has done for us. I would say so. I think I'm going to read my Bible every day and watch TV less. I'll set aside a half hour every day to read. I really let that go lately. They say it takes about 21 days to make something a habit so hopefully, after 40 days of reading the Bible, it will become a routine year-round. What better way to get to know God than to read his word? That sounds like a great idea. Can you please stand and join us as we worship this morning? <laughs>
Today's scripture lesson comes from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. That's found on page 1,653 in your pew Bible. Prepare your hearts for the reading of God's holy word. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May the Lord grant his blessing to the hearing and to the reading of it. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Father God, we pray that you would quiet our hearts before you this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together in corporate worship. And Lord, we hear the dire predictions of the future of the church that 60% of people who stopped going to church during this pandemic, Lord, are, are not going to come back. And, and Father, for those of us who understand the end times, we wonder if this is the great falling away. But Lord, that does not affect our worship. That does not affect our faith. Because, Lord, although our worship is corporate, we know our faith is personal. It's individual. And we have gathered here together this morning as a bunch of people who, who just love you, Lord, and who love each other. We take this opportunity, Father God, to intercede for others before your throne. We pray for our church family who struggle, Lord, with fear. And we pray that you would remind them that faith casts out fear. And that you are in control of all things and that you're either God or you're not. We can't have it both ways. We pray, Father God, for the persecuted church around the globe. We pray for those who are suffering for the cause of Christ today, even as we are here worshiping. We pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. And, and Lord, we pray for those who are on our prayer list this morning. We lift up to you Jess Knoll. We pray for YWAM Butuan and their discipleship training and thank you for a successful end in training indigenous leaders for the Philippines. We pray for Jess's new base, YWAM Davao. We pray for Jo and her upcoming surgery, for Gladys after her fall, for Harold Nestor who is still fighting the battle with cancer. That's the battle Luann is fighting as well. Father, we lift her up to you and Barb. We pray for Joni, and Lord, we pray for smoke, that, Father, he would be able to have a successful surgery. We pray for Ron, the Steigerwald family and Donald's loss. We pray for COVID patients, and we pray for all of our faith family who are diligently caring for the sick and COVID patients as well, putting themselves in harm's way. We pray for a spiritual wall of protection around Christ Church. We pray for a spiritual wall of protection around our faith family. And Father, we especially intercede for all of us who are here this morning within these walls that you would keep us safe. We also lift up before you, Father God, these whom we speak out before your throne. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. Yes. Yes, Lord.
We pray, Father God, for families. We pray for prodigal children. We pray, Father God, for the needs of our own hearts, for they are many. But Lord, the one thing that we all agree on this morning is that you're still God. You are in control. You are working all things together for good for those who have the eyes of faith to see it. So Lord, we're praying this morning that you just have your way with us. And we pray that you hear the love that we have for you in our hearts. As together we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray when he walked with us here on earth the first time. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. And grant us thy peace. Amen. Amen and amen. We'll continue our worship with our offering.
that. Good morning, boys and girls. Everybody's bright, alert this morning. That's good, I guess, because the sun's out for once. All right, boys and girls, I got some questions for you. I want you to think real hard. Where would you go to get better at a sport that you play? Maybe it's soccer or football or baseball, softball. Where do you go to practice and get better at those sports? You go to the gym, that's right, because you do gymnastics, so you have to do that in the gym, right? Okay. And for soccer players or football players or baseball, where would they go for that? You'd go to the football field or the soccer field, that's right. All right. Now, where do you go to learn stuff? Come on, that's right, you go to school, and maybe you go to... Uh, a public school or a private school, or maybe I know some of you are homeschooled, and a lot of you were homeschooled when uh, the pandemic first hit, and some of us are still on and off. Uh, I know the high schoolers, I can never keep up with where they are on any given day. <laughs> but we go to school, some kind of school. And, all right, now keep those two in mind. Where do we go to worship God? Church. We go to church? All right, good. You're all paying attention. Now, for all of those three things, are those the only places that we can go to get better at a sport as a gym or a soccer field? Or do we only go to school to learn, and do we only go to church, and that's the only place we can worship God? No, that's right. I heard some no's. I'll take it. I guess it was from the kids. <laughs> but if we want to get better at our sport, we can do that anywhere that we want, anywhere that we have a little bit of room to maybe kick a soccer ball or do our somersaults and our cartwheels. Uh, I've seen the girls do their gymnastics down here in the basement of the church. So they're getting better every time that they do that. And where else can you learn stuff besides at school? Outside. Okay, you can learn stuff outside, but what do you have to do? Maybe you need a book that is telling you information or you can go to the library, that's a great place to learn stuff, right? Or the internet sometimes has good things to teach us, sometimes not so much. And so we can do those kinds of things anywhere, like reading a book or going uh, using the computer at home, or if some of you have your parents' phones, you can learn stuff on there. And the same goes with church, right? We don't have to just come to church to worship God. In fact, God doesn't want us to just worship Him here on a Sunday morning. He wants us to worship him everywhere that we go because God isn't uh, locked down here in a building. He is with each and every one of us every day. Um, he's speaking to us. He's in our hearts. We have his word where he's constantly teaching us about him. And so God wants us to worship him, not in a special place like a church, but he wants us to be constantly uh, worshiping him and praying to him and reading his word. So let's all bow our heads and pray. Well, Father God, we thank you that our contact with you isn't restricted to just this building, that we can go and find any place where we can communicate with you and that we can learn about you and read your word 
and seek your guidance in our life. And we just pray that we can do that each and every moment of our day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. See me after a worship, because I will only be in one place with your snacks. You can't find me everywhere. <laughs>
a passage of scripture and it just smacks me right in the face. And one of those passages uh, years ago was James 2, 19. I'm not going to ask for you to say it out loud, but I'm sure that you have heard it. And this is what it says. James 2, 19. You believe that there, that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Now, if we follow that thought to its logical conclusion, it means that there is more to salvation than just believing in God. It is a troubling truth. How many people do you talk to when challenged about living their faith? They say, well, I believe in God and and in my head, I hear these words with that passage, well, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. <laughs> well, the problem is that many people have misunderstood the message of the gospel. And even more troubling, many churches have stopped preaching the truth. Now, as we talked about on Wednesday night at our Ash Wednesday service, some have relegated Christianity to just another religion on the list of the many religions of the world. Instead of realizing that Christianity isn't a religion at all, it is a personal relationship, just like the other personal relationships that you and I have in our lives. I know tons of people who in their head believe that God exists, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. But they have no desire to know him in a personal way. And if they do think of God as a person at all, they think he is a distant person, way too transcendent to have any kind of relationship with mere mortals. Now God in his word tells us the exact opposite. From the very beginning, God has been personally involved with human beings. Consider the words of Exodus 3.11. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. A personal relationship with God begins on a one-to-one -one level between each individual and God himself. When is the last time... You and God sat down and had a heart-to-heart. -heart. When is the last time you sat at your kitchen table and had a cup of coffee with God? God calls us by name, just like he called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He guides us and he takes care of us as individuals in, a very, in very real and tangible ways. He wants to be a part of our other relationships, just like he was with Adam and Eve and Abraham and Sarah. All the while, he is the God of time and space in control of all things. One of the things that separates mankind from the animals is self-awareness. Deacon and preacher have never lost sleep or been unable to eat because the next day they were going to go to the vet. They both slept soundly the day before they were neutered. <laughs> we, you and I, have a sense that we are human beings. We know that we are not things. And as human beings, we long for companionship. We start out in families. We develop friendships. We find soulmates to marry, to propagate the species, and to grow old with. We could even argue that our longing for companionship is there on purpose, put there by God, so that we would long for companionship with him. The psalmist wrote it so well in Psalm 42, 1. As the deer pants for the water, so my, so my soul longs for you, O God. 
You know, in 1923, a very influential watershed book was written by a famous Jewish philosopher named Martin Buber. The name of the work was Ich and Du, Ich und Du. Now, the whole book was translated to English in 1937, but if your Pennsylvania Dutch is a little bit rusty, that is translated I and Thou. Now, his premise was that human beings have two ways of understanding life. The attitude of I towards it, towards an object, and the attitude of I towards thou, towards a relationship. So the main premise of the book was that human beings can only find meaning in relationships. Now something I learned early on in the ministry is this, Johnny, pay attention. When you get crazy busy, and there is not enough time to complete everything that has to be done, as frequently happens in the ministry, and your lives as well, I suspect, I'm not minimizing how busy you are, do the relationship thing first. Take care of personal interactions before other tasks. If you are crazy busy, visit with your friend. If you are crazy busy, call your mom. Now this is what I've learned. If you do that, if you do the relationship thing first, I learned this in seminary actually, it was wacky, but this is what I learned. If you, if you put the relationship thing first because God cares more about people, Miraculously, and I mean it has to be miraculously, God sees to it that all of those other things get taken care of in plenty of time. It comes together like a puzzle, regardless of your deadlines. Try it. It works. Now, Boomer argued in his book that personalities are what make relationships possible and that relationships are not accidents. He also put forth that, that all relationships in life are small reflections of our relationship with the author of personalities, God himself. Heady stuff. So this pious Jews take on humanity was this. When God says in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and when he says again in Genesis 28, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He obviously was not talking physically. He wasn't talking about our arms and our legs and our noses and our mouths. He was talking about our personalities. He was talking about giving us purpose and self-awareness and free will, and the ability to relate and interact with each other. In other words, God gave us the essence of who we are in here. He gave us our personalities. Now think of it like this. When you look at a computer, you know it's a computer. You know inside are chips and, and drives and central processing unit, memory. When the computer is turned on, it starts up and it does different things because it isn't the chips or the hard drive or the screen that decide what it does. It's the software. It's the program. Computers may be similar physically, but they have different software, so they do different things. When you look at a sleeping human being, you know it's a person. You know inside are brain cells and that there are bones and there are muscles. And when the person wakes up, though, they start to do different things. But it isn't the brain cells or the bones or the muscles that control what they do. It's the personality operating the brain and other parts of the body that controls what they do. Human beings are similar physically, but we have different software, and we do different things. 
So the basic pattern of all personalities, as diverse as they are, is the image of God manifested in our lives. And just like any particular computer's basic operating system, it can be customized to the user. Our image of God is customized to express our individuality. So a doctor, a lawyer, an artist, a thief, all have the image of God. But they express their potential in different ways, customized as individuals. In the world in which we live, there are two trains of thought as to where we got our personalities or where our uniqueness comes from. One take on it says that our uniqueness comes from God, written in the traditional story of Genesis. The other take on it says that our personalities are accidental, that they are just a process of evolution. In other words, biblically, we are original works of priceless art. Evolutionary, we are random accidents of no more value than moss or a cockroach. Now, in ancient Hebrew and Greek, the languages of scripture, there is no word for personality. The Hebrew and Greek word that is traditionally translated personality is the word for soul. And now we're getting somewhere. The word closely related to soul is the word for spirit. It's why the psalmist wrote that his soul thirsted for God. That's why Jesus said that we should worship God, that we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mary said in Luke 1 46, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now the reality of those statements mean that the only way that we can relate to God, here's the deal, is in a personal way, not impersonal. In other words, the way we worship God is to step up and interact with him like a person relating to another person. It is the I-thou relationship that Martin Buber wrote so much about. Now, this is something that you need to get comfortable with. God is continually aware of you as an individual. He knows your name. Literally. And I mean, he knows you personally, by name. And he loves you, and he values you, and he appreciates you, and sometimes he shakes his head about you, sure. But your personality is a reflection of his. He has called you each one of you and myself included in that, he has called us to interact with him on a personal level. And that's how come Christianity is not a religion. That is why Jesus' greatest commandment in Mark 2.30 is, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We absolutely cannot relate to God by reciting memorized prayers. It just doesn't cut it. We absolutely cannot relate to God following prescribed rituals. It just doesn't cut it. But when we get it right, and we come before God and come to God as friend to friend. The joy overflows. And we can't help but burst forth in just spontaneous prayer and praise with our own words. We don't need it written down to paper. Words unique to our personalities. That's why the psalmist said, 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. 
So like I said before, God knows your name. Wherever you are, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, guess what? God's aware. You know, as each one of us matures in life, our names become associated with who we are as a person. I remember the first church that I served in Minersville, I asked that they not put my name on the bullet board out front. I said, could you just put S. Stock as the pastor? And they said, well, why? And I said, well, I don't want everybody to think that your new pastor is a bubble dancer. Now, the church board's take on that was, if they think you're a bubble dancer, they're going to show up to church. <laughs> it was Minersville, after all. But our names are very important. In Scripture, God is called by lots of names. Genesis alone calls God Elohim and Yahweh. Yahweh Elohim meaning the living God. El Elyon, meaning God Most High. El Shaddai, meaning God Almighty. Jesus told, uh, Jesus told us to call God our Father in Heaven in Matthew. Now, other names are found in other places. And all those names are important because they all point to different aspects of God. And there's a lot of God. Yahweh itself means He who causes to be. Now consider this for a moment. If you have names, you have an understandable language. Think about that. Language suggests self-aware personalities that communicate with each other. You see where I'm going with that? Language is one of the ways human beings are made in the image of God. Isaiah 40, 26, talking about the stars, that God brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. Now, how can God call anything by name if he doesn't have an understandable language? Genesis 2.19, so out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And that brings me back to the main point I talked about on Ash Wednesday. And that is the spiritual tabernacle that replaced the one that the Hebrews carried around on their back in the wilderness the real tent, the real tabernacle that is designed for personal communication between God and his people, the real tabernacle is a place where we interact with God directly, person to person, not as an impersonal thing. It is a place where we talk to God in personal ways, where we share hopes and dreams, purpose, value, Love, respect, appreciation. The real tabernacle is the structure intended for use in I-thou relationships and communication. And the real tabernacle is Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's where God touches our hearts, where he lives, becomes closer than a brother, so let's come together with God on a personal and intimate level. He is the source of, make, of, of, of all that makes us who we are. He, he's the source of our next breath. When we come to God on that gut level, we're going to find him to be very chatty. And we will begin to understand the purpose for which we have been created. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we admit to you that it is just safer and easier to come to you in an impersonal way. 
If we can memorize a prayer, we think we're covered. But Lord God, we get it. That is not what you require of your children. We are not jumping through hoops in a religion, Father God. We are coming to you as friend to friend. And we can all use a friend. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. Our benediction is taken from 1 Corinthians. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. Amen.